Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Stratford Metropolitan Planning Organization Joint Meeting of the Technical Advisory and Policy Committees. Today's date is Friday, November 4th, 2022, 9.07 a.m. And we're participating both in person and remotely. And why don't we find out who's here today and help me out. A lot of new faces for me, anyway. Um, if we start with Vanessa, we'll work through the room first. I am Vanessa Price. I'm at the town of Barrington. Uh, good morning, Ishmael Talon. I'm the town engineer in Durham. Lindsay Butler, town engineer in Newmarket. Bill Fisher, Farmington. Michelle Mears, city of Somerset. Don Hammond, Rochester. Barbara Holstein, Rochester. Michael Williams. <coughs> Marshall Goldberg, Brookfield. Aaron Golat, Milton. Joe Boudreau, Rochester. We're not going to forget to follow back there. We'll, ta we'll take the back row. Uh, Larry Brown, Milton. Don James Lee. But there's an extra DOT. Mark Richardson, Sarsory. I'm Bruce Woodruff. I'm the tech chair and I'm the Milton, <coughs> Milton Town Planner. Losing his voice. Uh, Dave Landry, uh, policy <laughs> chair of uh, Dover. Jen Sis, uh, SRPC director. And Colin Lutz, <coughs> SRPC. Okay, and remotely, uh, Katrin. Katrin Casper, Lee, New Hampshire. Nelson. Uh, Peter Nelson, New Market. Tim White. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Tim White, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, uh, Mobile Sources Supervisor. Steve Pesci. Good morning, everyone. Steve Pesci, University of New Hampshire Facilities and Stewardship Office. Anna Saunders from the Planning Department in Rochester. Mark. Mark Dunna, Town New Market, Land Director. Yeah. Oh, Bill Watson. Good morning, Bill Watson, New Hampshire DOT. Uh, Kim. Good morning, Kim Rimmel from DOT. Anna Benton. Good morning, Planning Director in Dover. And Jen, SRPC. Sure, for SRPC staff, um, uh, Megan, our office coordinator, who is there but not there, she stepped away from her desk briefly. Um, Rachel, Rachel Dewey, SRPC. Stephen, Stephen Geis, SRPC. Captain. Jackson? Jackson Rand, SRPC. Jill. 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 Okay, everybody. We have everybody. Uh, okay. You have the agenda. This is different for everybody. So we're having this joint meeting. And... Um, it's split up, but we're not actually splitting up physically immediately. We will do that later on in the process, probably an hour plus from now. But for now, we're you know it says convene. We're all we're all together, and then we'll do the split. So sorry that sound more confusing than probably. Um, so the tech the TAC committee is going to go first. And they're going to review the design and process mix, et cetera. And um, the policy folks will listen. We can have a joint discussion of all of it. Okay, Just like yeah. we're having a joint hearing for our planning and zoning. Okay, I thought the joint. That's okay. Okay, well, we're going to turn the policy committee loose. And <laughs> I'll intermingle it. As long as they've had some coffee. So, okay. So, oh, okay. Um, Thank you all for being here. I know this is extraordinary. Um, and we got materials uh, last night and the post of this morning. So I know this is the first time you're seeing some of the details. That's that's nothing against from the folks from VHB. Thank you, Greg and Jason, for being here. They have um, three RPCs worth of projects to do, and we were the easy one, if you can believe that. So um, they've been working their tails off and um, the, they sent along uh, project designs and estimates. Um, 
that you should have before you. And we have online as well for folks who are online, we'll be able to share those as we walk through. Um, and I, I apologize to the, to the folks online, you don't have a, a cost breakdown, but we can put that up on the screen as well to show the cost for all the projects. A couple of the projects have um, multiple alternatives as well. Um, so we'll want some input from municipalities on that. But to start with, um, why don't we just go down a list of projects uh, with uh, Greg or Jason? Yeah. Um, let me get things shared correctly. So, uh, on if, can folks see the the map with the yellow line on the on Zoom there? Okay. Um, so the PDF these these are just the um, the project maps. I didn't print out any of the traffic count data or anything like that. We do have those details here in hard copy, and I can reference them um, as well for for screen sharing. But just for the ease of discussion and viewing, I, I have the maps. Here, um, so first one is just uh, uh, and for folks here in the room, um, we we made a key. So D U R is Durham, um, and this is the their their second project or or B. Um, so this is the Durham Point Road project. So why don't we just start start going for it, uh, Greg or Jason? Thanks yeah, I'll here. take over. Sure, um, <clears throat> and I'll uh, you know keeping an eye on the time, uh, I won't dwell too much, but um, I do want to say in advance, I apologize that everybody didn't have a better chance to review these. Um, and, you know, we, we took the information provided to us, we did field inspections, we took traffic data, you know, we tried to assimilate all the information. Um, and we developed conceptual designs. And what's missing is we didn't have back and forth with the communities on, you know, are these the alternatives you have envisioned, that sort of thing. And some of them we feel are, you know, going to be pretty close to what was envisioned. And some of the details would be worked out in the next phases once the projects are funded. Um, but we certainly, you know, after today, we're certainly available um, to provide more feedback or review th or revise things if needed. But uh, so let me just jump in. Um, this is the Durham Point Road project. It's about 3.7 miles um, of windy, as you can see, windy, um, narrow roadway that also ha is fairly rolling uh, and heavily tree-lined. Um, I've driven it several times uh, in reviewing it, and um, the, the purpose for the project is um, to springboard off of what is basically a uh, pavement rehabilitation project to make other changes to address safety concerns. Apparently, this project um, had uh, 71 incidents, and I'm presuming those are crashes. Um, and you know, there's definitely a safety uh, concern along the roadway. I think there was actually uh, there have been two fatalities. Um, so we really. Um, are hesitant to do what, you know, years ago, right out of the gate, we probably would have said, let's widen the road, let's add shoulders, let's make it, you know, more compatible for bicyclists. And by the way, there's a heavy bike uh, component out here. It's a very scenic, desirable um, road cycling um, route. So it does get a lot of use. Um, but, but I think widening the road, adding shoulders would have totally changed the, um, the complexion of the roadway and I think would have been incompatible uh, with with what it is, you know, it's a scenic road, um, and uh, would have also been extremely impactful. There's places where there's houses very close, stone walls, uh, wetlands, things like that. Um, getting getting a lot of feedback here. If everybody could mute, I guess um, that's better. Um, so what we looked at then to improve conditions were to do spot improvements. Uh, we categorize those in three different areas. One is um, where there were some combination of horizontal and vertical curvature, where sight distance was really extremely limited. We thought, okay, there's a location where we could do uh, a spot geometric improvement. Uh, and that might be, you know, lowering a crest curve a little bit, 
Um, it could be, uh, I think we were leaning towards just widening the road in spot locations. So when I was driving it, one of the first times I drove the road, I was coming to a, um, a crest curve, a very steep crest curve. And there was a bicyclist coming in, you know, at me and there was a car passing him in my, on my side of the road. So it was clearly not a safe condition. Um, so what would I do there? I think lowering the road would be a major project. There's places where, you know, there's ledge or there's homes nearby. Um, but widening it would have given that car the opportunity at that one location to pass the cyclists and maybe not be on my side of the road. Uh, we could have maybe shared the road, all three of us. So, um, so that's what we've proposed is spot widenings, spot geometric improvements. Um, this particular, uh, the first sheet, there are three sheets here. The first sheet, uh, we've highlighted where the, um, uh, the rep, I'm sorry, the recycling center is the, um, uh, not the landfill, the, um, transfer station. It just happens where the, the drive to the transfer station, uh, is blind to vehicles heading westbound. Uh, and you have, you know, large trucks pulling out of there, a lot of cars, um, you know, during the week coming in and out. And, uh, there's one location where we thought, yeah, fixing the horizontal and vertical uh, geometry would make a huge difference. Uh, so we didn't identify every little spot along the way. Our cost estimate assumed about three um, significant spot locations where we would do improvements. Um, we also identified a number of places where on the inside of curves, the the trees are really impacting sight lines. And it would be a pretty straightforward exercise to, you know, clear the right of way of trees that are overhanging and or uh, just, you know, blocking uh, sight lines within the inside of curves. So, um, so I think those three types of solutions applied judiciously uh, would make a huge difference. Um, there are also some places where there are other safety concerns, like there's a, um, I think in this, that figure we were pointing out where there's um, a wetland right up next to the roadway and there's no guardrail or the guardrail is some flimsy old wooden railing that, yeah, that should be fixed. You know, there's spot safety concerns like that. And then as part of the roadway rehabilitation, I think there would be drainage improvements where culverts have failed or where there's a beaver dam or that sort of thing, um, you know, along the road. So, so those are the types of improvements we envisioned. Um, we certainly could make a, you know, an, an imp uh, a really sizable difference without changing the total, total character of the roadway. Um, if you go along, Colleen, we just kind of pointed out some of the most critical areas, but not much else to see in the plan view. And uh, we did an estimate in today's dollars for all of these projects um, based on some, you know, recent bid pricing, which is higher than it was a year ago and higher than it was two years ago. Um, and for this project, our summary was just under three million. Which are, I think, you see, are you seeing me pan around the images and move them up and down or is it just- Yes. It, yep, no, that's good. Down? Yep. Make sure. Yep. Okay. Um, so, that, you know, the, the plan view is not that exciting, but I think it pointed out where we would make some revisions. So this is Durham B or Durham A, I guess. Um, the 155A Main Street intersection. Um, it's about 1,600 feet west of the existing roundabout uh, on Main Street, and uh, it's almost midway between the Route 4 ramps and that roundabout. Um, we originally drew this as a simple one lane roundabout and then we received um, updated traffic information. And we learned that the northbound approach would fail uh, if it was just a one lane roundabout. So that's why you see uh, a right lane slip ramp uh, avoiding the roundabout there. That right turn is heavy at certain times of day. And if it was entering the roundabout, you'd have failure on that approach. Um, so, and you can see there's another slip ramp um, eastbound coming from Main Street uh, to go down 155. It's down to the left, Colin. Uh, yeah, right there. That one's there, not for traffic purposes, but because it's such a skew angle, uh, it would be very difficult for um, larger vehicles to make that turn. Uh, so we're basically, you know, giving everybody a way out uh, to, to make that 
skewed uh, right turn. Um, so we sized the roundabout the same as the other roundabout that's you know to the east. Uh, we accommodated relocating the uh, multi-use path that is in the southeast quadrant. Um, there are wetlands in two corners that would be impacted you know, there and there and um, some utility poles, but that's pretty minor. Um, uh, I will say that uh, based on field inspection, uh, stormwater management is gonna be a challenge on this one. There is really uh, no convenient place to discharge a underground collection system. Um, today, everything just runs off the side of the road into roadside ditches, which is common, you know, um, uh, type of drainage. So we would try, you know, in a final design setting, we would try to uh, propagate that approach and let the water run off as much as we could. But we're adding curbing here with the slip ramp, with the um, the uh, the bike path, and and that sort of thing. So we're going to have to get creative in final design on how we manage the stormwater. So we did include a fairly hefty, I think, cost for stormwater um, because it's really going to be a challenge. Uh, there are right of way impacts, you know, in the corner at the southern, the southern two corners. Um, but Jason, I don't know if you want to mention how this would would perform um, operationally. Sure, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Plord. Um, so operationally, you know, with this roundabout in place, um, all of the approaches would be able to operate at level of service D or better under 2042 traffic volume conditions. So what we did was we did a 20-year design horizon. Uh, one of the challenges, as Greg had pointed out, was that during the uh, weekday morning peak hour, the northbound right turns uh, would be from Mast Road onto Main Street going eastbound, uh, about 300 vehicles per hour. And during the weekday evening, about 425 vehicles per hour. Uh, so that's that's quite a heavy demand, and that that was really the need for that slip right turn lane. Mm -hmm. um, designed a little bit differently than the eastbound approach on Main Street, where those right turns, they're fairly light in volume, less than 20 vehicles per hour. Um, but because of the geometric geometries approaching, uh, the layout, um, it, it's really blending in and merging in directly uh, south of the roundabout. But as you can see on the right side of the screen, um, those northbound right turns are going into their own lane and then they need to merge back down. And that's just because of that heavy demand and the conflict with about 600 to 875 vehicles per hour that are going eastbound um, from the left to the right. Uh, straight through. So really a lot of conflicts, but I think that for the roundabout uh, design, that's going to be a whole lot better than trying to process um, different traffic movements through a signalized intersection. Did you check signal warrants? I can't remember. Uh, we did. Um, and um, there's, there's the engineering judgment that comes into play when you're talking mm -hmm. about right turns approaching an intersection. Uh, whether those northbound rights should be included or not. If we did include those northbound rights from a minor street approach, then we would be triggering the signal warrants. Um, but if those were removed, then we would not be meeting the signal warrants because it's okay. just not as much of a demand on the uh, southbound approach coming down Mast Road or the northbound movements going left and through. Thank you. I think um, at its core, you know, this is a safety improvement project too. And um, the conditions we observed today in the intersection are a little bit scary. You know, you have um, a high volume approach coming from the south, uh, stop controlled into Main Street, which is not stop controlled, it's free flow. Uh, and you have a two lane approach. So when two cars are approaching side by side, they tend to block each other's view. Uh, and then you also have left turn lanes on Main Street, which also when there's a car waiting uh, can also block sight lines. Um, so, you know, the types of crashes you would expect here uh, would probably be fairly, you know, severe because they're going to be broadsides. Um, so I think the, the roundabout really addresses the safety concern. And I think another, another thing that's attractive about it is that you're extending the traffic calming aspect uh, that's created by the roundabout further west from the campus and from the downtown uh, towards Route 4. When people come off Route 4, they tend to have a mindset that they're still on route four. And um, this is, you know, just extending that transition zone a little further. And I think it's really beneficial. I think that's all I had to say. 
Oh, and, and uh, the, yeah, the bottom line, um, the estimate for this one is about 1.4 million. I want to note that we included, you know, the 1.4 million includes design, it includes construction services costs, and it includes the assumption that these would be, these projects would be issued as LPA projects, um, which definitely adds process and adds cost. Um, so that's all part of it. Um, so on to the next one. Um, Greg? Yes. Greg, Dave Landry, um, just a kind of a point of order here. Um, if we could, it might be beneficial unless you'd rather hold for questions at the very end of all the presentations. Maybe when, um, I'm guessing because you took two Durham's in a row that we could take a pause after the two Durham ones and then after the summer's worth and lead ones that have multiple and ask if people have questions rather than waiting till the very end. It's an awful lot to have people try to keep track of and remember their questions and why they had those questions if we go all the way through before we give people an opportunity to ask. Yeah, I'm, that I think that's a great idea. Yeah, great idea. And in fact, I wouldn't mind doing it after each one. Um, so I'm happy to go back to the first one if we want to do that. <clears throat> okay, oh, well, let's do, let's do that. And then um, we'll have questions after each individual one going forward. So does anybody have any questions um, in the yes. room, uh, April? I, I, thank you. I just wanted to point out, so, and I don't think I heard Greg mention this, but um, uh, under Point Road, it serves as a, an emergency detour bypass um, during the Mother's Day type flooding events when we have, you know, Hamble Brook is is closed at 108, uh, the new market flats are closed and flooded, and so provides a, a, a major detour route to go from Durham to New Market and, uh, and you know, south to north as well. So I just wanted to point that out. It's also definitely a collector road for that eastern part of Durham. There's a lot of smaller subdivisions and, and other roadways that feed into it. Um, and, and Jen, it looks like... Um, yeah. Go for it, Wayne, and then Steve. Um, I'm sorry for being late. I, I missed put this on my calendar. Um, first of all, I want to point out that the Durham Point Road project, Durham Point Road has, has experienced twice as many incidents as the Rotary project has, and there's been one fatality. There's been 71 incidents on Durham Point Road. Uh, over the last few years. And I, I understand why it didn't get rated high because few of you have ever heard of it, much less driven on it, I'm sure. But two weeks ago, the Durham Town Council took this issue up. And I would like to, if, if Chairman Landry, to read a, sh a brief resolution that I was asked to present uh, at this time, if that's okay with you. Okay, go ahead. The resolution uh, that the Stratford Regional Planning Commissioners, the Policy and Technical Advisory Committees, and the New Hampshire Department of Transportation include Durham Point Road in the state of New Hampshire's 10-year transportation plan to reconstruct and repave Durham Point Road from Route 108 to Bay Road to address roadway deficiencies, including stormwater management and water quality improvements, enhanced flood resiliency, habitat and fish, amphibian passage, vehicle transportation, and cyclist safety, IDA compliance, and improvements in multimodal transportation. Whereas the town's Durham Point Road, a scenic road with numerous historical features and recreational opportunities is a major collector road serving both state, local, and regional transportation interests. Historic data indicates a significant record of crash incidents, including one fatality and 71 crashes involving moving and fixed objects in the 10 year period between 2010 and 2020. And whereas the roadway is in poor condition with roadway-based failure throughout the project limits and minimal pedestrian or ADA accommodations, and whereas the existing stormwater management system consisting of over 20 culvert crossing and a limited closed drainage system is in disrepair and provides minimal water quality treatment, inadequate fish and amphibian passage or flood natural hazard resiliency. And whereas, Traffic on the roadway has increased over the years, so has the rate of speed, which is of significant concern. Durham Point Road provides access to the University of New Hampshire's Jackson Estuarine Laboratory 
and to over 1,000 vehicles weekly to the town of Durham's recycling center and transfer station, which promotes sustainable environmental practices. Yet the access to this critical facility is lacking in sight distances and clear sight lines. Last week, when I left the, the, the uh, transfer station, a truck came over the hill and around the corner and almost hit me. And, and it was a personal reminder of why this project is so important. The town of Durham, Durham encourages non-carbon producing modes of transportation, and Durham Point Road serves as a seacoast region asset providing a popular venue for cyclists, hikers, and pedestrians. Yet the roadway is not currently constructed to an adequately enable those alternatives. I might add 50 years ago when I moved to Durham was a great place to try out your MG because it's designed like a European racetrack. It still is. It hasn't changed one bit. I, I test my Miata at 12 o'clock at night sometimes. Whereas <laughs> Durham Point Road serves as an alternate route in lieu of traveling on Route 108, connecting Durham, Newmark, and points south with Durham and points north during road closures related to construction, down trees, and so forth. I was really unhappy that the Department of Transportation, when they did the 108 project, did not include flood control. I say that again. People think it did. It did not include flood control. And when we had a big flood a few years ago, we could not get to Newmark other than by Durham Point Road. So emergency vehicles going to Wentworth Douglas Hospital, I mean, down to Exeter Hospital or southbound could not take 108. They had to take Durham Point Road. And that is not designed, I can tell you, for emergency vehicles. <laughs> uh, the Durham Town, the governing and legislative body of the town of Durham does here. I adopt this resolution and, and urge the um, SRPC and, and the TAC committee to include it in the plan. I, that was a very good presentation the state made, Mr. Bacos, I appreciate that very much. Um, but because um, none of you have probably seen this road or tried to drive it, uh, it's probably uh, didn't rate as highly as it, it, it should have. And I, I thank you very much for your time. And I, again, I apologize for being late to the party. And I, I hope that this project will get the attention that it certainly deserves. Thanks very much. Steve, you had a question? No, another question. I just want to support a, a Durham's project. Uh, obviously the university has uh, facilities at the Brown Center as well as the Jackson Lab at Adams Point. And uh, obviously uh, a lot of our students are the ones doing that cycling loop, which is a classic loop, the Durham Point loop from Durham to Newmarket. So I want to just amplify the importance of this road for a safety improvement project and look forward to speaking to the next one. And Bill, I got a couple of questions in the room and I'll, I'll get to you next. Yeah, that's right. I just have some questions. I, I don't need to make statements uh, in my consideration of, of uh, doing these things that we're supposed to do here today. I, I wanted to know what the average daily traffic was. And I also wanted to know uh, if any alternative strategies uh, for making these improvements possibly at a lower cost while still getting uh, the bang for your buck were considered. Yeah, I don't know as we got traffic data. I did look on New Hampshire DOT's um, road data website and i think they were showing uh close to a thousand vehicle day vehicles per day on the western end close to route 108 and then it peters out as you head east um as far as alternative strategies i think we'd assume that the the pavement is in such poor condition that um, pavement reclamation would be the most cost effective uh, method to repair the pavement and that would include uh, deep reclamation as well as adding some crushed stone for strength and then paving. But along with that, we would have to do some drainage improvements, including ditching and subdrain and that sort of thing to preserve your investment. Um, as far as the safety improvements, I think I think the way I described it is what we are recommending is um, spot improvements, identify where the most critical um, you know, horizontal and vertical deficiencies are so that the site distance can be improved, um, the tree clearing and that sort of thing, but not doing 
uh, like I said, not doing a wholesale widening of the road because that would just add to speeds. So, um, you know, the other thing we thought of was you, you could potentially um, focus on a portion of the road if funding was an issue. Uh, can I make a quick comment on that, David? <clears throat> uh, Very quick. Um, I need to point out that the state did a beautiful job of improving the intersection of Durham Point Road and 108. And one of the effects of that is far more people now use Durham Point Road because the state did such a wonderful job of improving that intersection. It's, it's I really, you see a, 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 an increase in traffic on the road because of their good work. No good deed goes undone. Uh, this is uh, Dave again. And I, and I, uh, believe it or not, I'm normally a rather organized person, but this is, this is new, what we're doing here. And so, what I want to make sure I understand is the following. Um, it's perfectly fine to have questions after each one of these is presented, but I believe we reserve time later on for people to make, you know, their, you know, particular pitches for some projects and whether one is better than another yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So as hard as it is to, you know, hold back on the pitches, <laughs> uh, I would suggest that, you know, we listen to the projects, questions be asked about each project, and then save your pitches until you can get through the whole thing, because otherwise we're going to have pitches on the front end and pitches on the back end, and the sun's going to be going down. Okay? So... You, mean you want uh, me to read it again? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> You can do it again after the meeting if you buy me a cup of coffee. How's that? Um, so anyway, is there any other questions? Yeah, Larry. Yeah, Larry Brown. Uh, one of the last things we need is what I will call buzzword bingo. Uh, and uh, that message from, from the Durham Town Council or whatever they say uh, strikes me as being exactly that buzzword bingo, particularly the amphibian resiliency. Uh, th I thank the chair for his plan. Uh, anybody else in the room? We better go. Uh, yeah. Bill Watson. Oh, sorry. See you, Bill. Bill Watson. Yeah. Good morning. I have two technical questions for um, for for Greg or for the Regional Planning Commission. The first is for all of the projects. Do the costs that you're presenting reflect inflation? or the 10% indirect costs or others that would, were asked for as part of this process. And the second question is, um, how would um, the group propose funding Durham Point Road? It's not eligible for federal aid. Those are my two questions, thank you. Yeah, to the first question, um, we estimated these on 2022 dollars. Um, so I, I understand the RPC may grow them based on some assumed um, inflation rates. Yeah, as part of the decision making or the recommendations that have come back to the department, the expectation is it's going to be a 2.8% growth rate per year plus 10% um, indirect as part of the uh, sele um, selection process that the group or groups are going through this morning. Okay. Okay, Greg, uh, what's the next one? I think we were gonna answer questions to the Durham Roundabout first. Bart, you're, oh, I apologize. you're right. Bart, are you all set? I just had uh, one question. Was signage um, as an alternative for traffic common um, in thought of? Cause I know that at the transfer station, there's a basically a hill um, that, um, so I'm just wondering if there was an opportunity there to save some costs to uh, add additional signage. Yeah, I didn't think we saw that as the solution. Um, you know, the people observing signage versus changing the physical, you know, geometry, I think I'd weigh them differently. Um, but I think maybe in combination, signage might help. Right, like, yeah, as Especially a additional, additional measure. Yeah. There are uh, a lot of um, uh, shadows on the road for the bicyclists and the pedest and the uh, the motorists to at least alert motorists that it is a heavily used uh, bike route. Uh, we would encourage that to continue. 
Yeah, I was just thinking more of um, if you're coming from Newmarket going towards mm-hmm. Durham, you mm-hmm. know, right before you hit that transfer station, there's a deep uh, decline. Yeah. Um, and so, like, maybe before they're saying, hey, slow down. You know, right. So, um, or vehicles entering. I've, I've, been, I've been almost hit a few times, too. I used to live in Durham, so. Yeah. <laughs> Danger. Yep. All right. Now we're on to the second one, then, Greg. Uh, any questions on the second one that Greg presented in Durham? Does anybody remotely have any questions on the second Durham project? I would love okay. to know what made a roundabout the choice when there's two others just really, really shortly after, as opposed to a light or something else. I think. Um, I didn't to hear you, uh, Katrina. That was your question, right? Well, yeah. The question. Just there's so many roundabouts in that in that strip. It's it's um it's very intense. I, I drive it every day, and I was just curious as to why a roundabout was the choice as opposed to a light or something different. Just because it's so roundabout heavy. I I guess um, from my perspective, the roundabout would be safer, and uh, you know roundabouts have certain other advantages such as. Um, really good capacity and you know what i love about them is during off peak hours it's really free flow nobody's sitting there burning gas um and i think the fact that there are others is actually a good thing people are used to them and you know know how to navigate them well um but i I guess if i would add from the university's perspective there's actually only the one yeah. Further down at North Drive, there's not multiples. Right. But um, we have always, for years, the de- town and the university have looked at the roundabouts as a preferred solution, not just for the traffic control safety, but uh, as Greg was mentioning, changing the driver behavior. Uh, so as one approaches the campus and the downtown, you hit a roundabout, there is a very big uh, visual awareness that the character of the neighborhood and the roadways have changed. It is a 25 mile per hour speed limit on the right side. So Main Street east of this location is 25 miles per hour as it is throughout all of campus and downtown. So uh, the university really would prefer not to see a traffic signal as a gateway marker to our uh, campus that does not quite fit in with the agricultural landscape that you're going through so we have always preferred a roundabout option here and i'm glad to see the engineering design presented if i can add uh to what steve and and greg have already said um this is a jason floor from vhb again the north okay there's 25 30 people that's actually let's keep things in order bruce you're up well, I had a question about the uh, severe approach angles uh, on this design, and and I'm not uh, I'm not criticizing that except for the fact that my question revolves around the fact that uh, changing the approach angle would probably have increased the cost of this project exponentially. Yep. I, I understand that you have made the slip ramp, but I do have a concern uh, about the merge from the slip ramp. To those that are actually coming off the the roundabout itself, and, and I'm not sure a yield sign is going to help. It's a very short distance. Um, I wonder, and maybe you could talk about this besides yep. the cost, because obviously what you would want to do is make that approach angle less severe. And uh, how much more would that cost? And don't you see a problem with the merge there? Yeah, we, um, I share that concern that you're really not providing um, a geometric reason for people to slow down as they make that right turn um, because they're in a slip ramp. It's pretty free flow, right? Um, but we did give them 200 feet. Uh, once they are uh, parallel to the through lane, we gave them 200 feet to merge uh, and then taper down beyond that. So I think... In a 25 mile an hour zone, I think that's plenty. I think that's very adequate. Um, if this was more of a high speed roadway, I'd be a little more concerned, but um, I think I think it would work fine. Thank you. And I do agree that 
we, you know, had we had our druthers, we would have lined that approach up more perpendicular to Main Street, but that would have been, yeah, considerably more money. Uh, Wayne, you got a question? Uh, yes. The, when we put speed bumps on Madbury Road, there was vast opposition from the Durham Fire Department. Um, what impact would the rotary have on response time for safety vehicles who have to go out that road when they have to go around two rotaries to get out to the highway or wherever they're going? Have, have they weighed in on this at all? Yeah, I don't know if the community has talked to uh, emergency response, but uh, we've actually done, we've actually timed uh, fire trucks through roundabouts and it has, you know, a, a difference in the five second, ten, seven second range um, compared to just a straight through green light at a traffic signal. Um, you know, that's assuming that all the cars got out of the way uh, at a traffic signal, but um, the roundabout is designed to easily accommodate uh, a circulating fire vehicle so i don't i don't see it as a major issue all right anybody thank else? you yep thank you everybody um lots of good questions just a reminder while we're talking about some of these sections uh these items and, and questions are coming up Keep your, you know, your bar chart in front of you to see what the major focus was on each project, and it, it'll help to frame some of the questions, probably. So, Greg, uh, where do you want to go next? Next uh, project, whichever one's up. Yep. <clears throat> uh, this is Lee. So, this project, the uh, purpose and need, again, is revolving around safety. And, you know, very obvious here, you have um, unique intersection configurations where you have very skewed approaches. Um, this was uh, just for a little background. Uh, some UNH students did a capstone uh, project here and, and looked at how they could revise this intersection. And they came up with some great uh, T type uh, concepts as well as eliminating a leg uh, on the three sided triangle. Um, we ended up eliminating a leg as well, but a different leg than they did because we had the benefit of traffic data. So um, what we are showing here is the preferred uh, solution is to eliminate that hatched area. That is that that is one of the legs um, to bring everybody uh, to one, primarily to one intersection, which is on the bottom right, which is Route 155 uh, crossing, uh, what is that called? Lee Hook Road. Um, today, Route 155 is free flow, uh, so the approaches all uh, have to find gaps in the traffic and, and enter the, the free flow condition. And this, the concern with that is with some of these skewed angles, with some of the vertical and horizontal geometry, it's not always safe to do so. Um, and, you know, people get frustrated if they've been sitting there for a while and they may take chances. So um, what we're now proposing is eliminating that one leg and then uh, creating a four-way four stop intersection down at the right. Uh, so that would eliminate the concern with the high, higher speed broadside crashes, which is the biggest concern in an, in an area like this. Um, so, uh, you know, we did not look at signalizing. It wouldn't really warrant signalizing any of these intersections. Uh, so this was alternative one. It's, it's the low cost alternative, fairly straightforward. If you go to the next one, we said, what about a roundabout? Uh, and it's huge, you know, it blows out the intersection. Um, it would function great. It would provide access in all directions. It would have, you know, improved safety in all sides. Um, one disadvantage of three approach roundabouts is you don't get the deflection you'd like to have on all the approaches. So it wouldn't be super effective at um, you know, reducing speeds uh, in all directions, but it would still be a safety improvement compared to what's out there today. Uh, it's multiple, you know, uh, dollars compared to the other alternative. Uh, the triangle alternative, we estimated it just over $200,000 because really all you're doing is removing some pavement and adding some sidewalk um, versus $1.1 for the roundabout. So, um, 
and we did look at other alternatives. We looked at the UNH alternatives and we came up with some of our own, but these were the only two we felt were worthy of presenting. Uh, Jason, anything on the traffic side you wanted to mention? Yeah, I, I think that you you nailed it, Greg. It's really 155 is the major route, the free flow traffic, the heavier demand as compared to uh, the other approaches. Um, I think that with, you know, UNH really, the students really got the ball rolling with thinking outside the box of trying to figure out which legs to remove. How do you make it safer? How do you accommodate pedestrian travel? Um, you know, like, like Greg said, we we just had a little bit more of an advantage because we had traffic volumes to be able to support which design to really go with. And can we remove that same concept of removing one of the legs? And uh, that's, you know, from an operational perspective, we're talking about with the all-way stop on the bottom right and um, just having the Lee, Lee Hill Road uh, northbound approach on the bottom left. Um those operations are all going to be at like levels of service A and B under 2042 design year conditions. So one one thing is um, there are no sidewalks within this whole snapshot here of the project. Um, we're showing in orange on the left side a, a short sidewalk um, leading to the library and the town hall. Uh, and Lee has another proposal to add a multi-use or shared use path along that side of the road as well. Um, heading further north. So we felt we could at least extend it all the way down to here. If that path ever happens, it would be you know, an advantage to extend at least some pedestrian uh, access through here. Question in the room here from John. Yeah, this is a first, I live in Lee, this is the first time I've seen this particular one. Is this the first time you're floating this model? We've talked about that. This is the first time we've the seen team, this. The team this, was yeah. in the last paperwork. When we ran. Yeah, but this so is the first time we've seen the professional yes, design. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so what you're saying is stop signs where where uh, Lee Hook Road comes into 155. Is that what's being proposed? Stops four way stop. Four way. Today Correct. it's two. Today it's two way stop, and we would make it four. Since we're adding more traffic at that intersection, and since the safety concerns are there, um, the stop signs would address that. Well, you can be stopped though at that intersection coming north on 155 to turn left on the George Bennett. Yep. And you can be sitting there waiting and go, and someone can whip around the corner and still nail you. <laughs> they they come from the from on 155 from from north to south here. There's a bit of a blind spot because there's a rise. Yep. If they're around and they don't know there's a stop sign, they're going to have to scream to a halt at that stop sign because it's too far down the road. If you nip a little out of the triangle, that would help. And how does someone come from the school to the safety complex on George Bennett? And how do you make that right-hand turn? You go way out in that <clears throat> pointy intersection? How do you how do you come north to south, turn left on George Bennett? I mean, sorry, right on George Bennett. Yeah. Right. So that's, 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 that's all the traffic in town, highway department, safety complex, library. There's a lot of in-town traffic that goes that direction. That looks difficult to navigate. Yeah, any large vehicles would have a, a problem with that. You make a good point. You know, we would need to trim that that nose of the island back for sure. And since we're changing, uh, if we, if this option was pursued, um, definitely we would have to uh, have some advanced warning signs because it's changing the traffic control on the 155 approaches. You bring up a great point as far as anybody that's coming southbound on 155. How do they know that there's a stop sign ahead? So that's why we would have the advanced warning signs that there's a stop ahead. So on that particular, it's just Dave Landry, on that particular point Dawn's making, does the, the other proposal uh, with the traffic circle address that particular point in a better way? I realize there's more money involved, I get that. Just asking the question. Yes. It's much more conventional and, and uh, sight lines are better. There is, uh, there is a grade differential out there, isn't there, Greg? There is. So um, Route 155 sits a little bit higher than the surrounding roads to the bottom left. So the 
there would need to be some thought put into grading and how you would do that. The roundabout would be tipped to one side. It wouldn't be, you know, we're looking at it in 2D, but it would be it would be tipped from right to left a little bit. Not not a deal breaker, but it's certainly a consideration. Yeah, one more question. <clears throat> it seems to me there are other alternatives here. And that's a comment. But the question is, did you look at other alternatives? Uh, and if you did, uh, what does that do to the project cost? Yeah. <clears throat> um, Jason, from a traffic perspective, mm -hmm. we discounted some of those, right? I mean, correct, correct. So when, um, so, West Mill Pond Road is that, if you want to look at it like a big giant A, so it's the top left part where it's hatched out on the screen right now. Uh, when when we had kept that leg in and we removed the 155 top right part of the A, um, and that was one of the preliminary designs or, or concepts that was thought of, um, that, you know, that option resulted in poor levels of service, and I'm talking about level of service E and F because of the heavy demand along 155 that would have to shift over. So if you're thinking about it, if you're coming from north to south, that those vehicles would have to come over um, to, yeah, coming straight down, Colin, in that hatched area, right. You'd have to come straight down, then turn left from a stop condition, then turn right on, you know, from another stop condition to be able to go southbound, continuing on 155. So you you would be diverting more cars um, than if you um, remove the top left portion where it's hatched in right now and maintain the thoroughfare along 155. So we did evaluate that option. We also looked at the um, the the T uh, right right yeah. so that that whole um, it was three different uh, T type signal um, sorry unsignalized intersections and that again was shifting the 155 uh, thorough uh, through vehicles to come in straight down through the middle exactly Colin right where you're showing it and so they would have to turn again left from a stop condition where that 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 is the pred predominant traffic volume flow as compared to the vehicles that are on uh, George Bennett Road. So it's um, we did evaluate those different uh, alternatives, and we decided to pursue other alternatives just because of the long delays, levels of service, E's and F's uh, with those other alternatives. Follow-up question is, is, is the, the center section, is that sacred for uh, community reason? Right. We were wondering that as well. I didn't no. see any. I didn't see any not, big monuments or anything. Yeah, not at all. And we have yep. a tree that um, we had lit, but we actually need to replace it. It you could do whatever you wanted with it. Okay. All right. All right. Next. Next up. So back in Lee again. Um, this is the shared use path uh, that is proposed along one side of the road. And um, connecting up, you know, a bunch of different origins and destinations for pedestrians on one side. Um, we're showing it as a 10 foot wide paved path separated from the roadway at a minimum of five feet for safety. Um, and without curbing and just keeping it flush with the surroundings. Um, so this one, you know, it, at face value, it seemed very straightforward, you know, basically just build a path. Um, the concern is, uh, you know, the devil's in the details, is how do you deal with stormwater? Uh, the roadway runoff um, would need to go somewhere, and we don't want it crossing the path uh, because that ends up, you know, having uh, sand and silt on the path as well as ice in the winter and just, you know, not a good idea to have the roadway runoff go across the path. So how do you intercept it? Uh, this, my field inspection uh, showed that this is an extremely flat area. The roadway itself has very little profile to it, um, and the surrounding ground is relatively flat as well. So there's, I, we did not identify um, obvious or good locations to outlet a drainage system. So if we put in catch basins and pipes and manholes, where would we run it to? So um, we're thinking, and in, in our cost estimating. Uh, either solution could be fairly costly compared to the path. 
Um, one would be to run the drainage all the way to the wetland that is up in the upper left corner of this picture. Um, so it'd be a big cross country pipe. Uh, you know, physically, we don't even know if it would work uh, distance versus grade wise. And, you know, unless we had survey, but um, that seemed like one alternative. Another one is I, I pointed out on the that little red square area uh, is a depressed area near that parking lot. My guess is that was installed to collect runoff from that parking lot and detain it. Um, so what we would consider is uh, running a drainage system to that and expanding it. Now it's all on private property. Uh, it's not town owned so that we would need to, you know, work with the property owners and, um, you know, there's a high likelihood that there would be a minimal to that because they're going to benefit from having a safe pedestrian facility. You know, there's a school here, there's, um, you know, different um, uses that are going to generate and, and benefit from the project. Um, so that's one, that's another alternative. And then a third one is to just do a bunch of infiltration areas between the road and the path, as well as on the other side of the path where we could uh, hopefully infiltrate some of that water. So <clears throat> we're not dealing with a large uh, volume of runoff. So bottom line is, seemed like a really inexpensive, straightforward project if it weren't for drainage. So we did include a, a in the cost estimate, a you know, decent number for the drainage. Otherwise, you know, well supported. I think it's a great idea to have this project uh, collecting pedestrians on that side of the road, get them off the road where they're probably walking today or on the side of the road today. The road doesn't have wide shoulders, so um, it would definitely be an improvement with a the school there. I'm in the room, Greg, was that uh, Yeah, um, it's definitely needed for the safety of people being able to be in the village and get from place to place. Yep. Uh, as drainage, the quote wetlands in your upper left hand corner is actually uh, a bog, which is on the New Hampshire Natural Heritage Bureau list. Okay. It's, uh, it's not something you dump storm water into. Right. So that alternative should be out. Yep. Uh, the current detention pond was where the school district bought land from the church to be able to put in drainage because that was always called Lake Mass Way. Uh -huh. um, Rain, it would pond the parking lot and make it impossible to get through. So they built it for the size of that park parking lot. So your option three of multiple infiltration sites, rain gardens, would be much more appealing and probably much more cost effective. Yeah. Thank you. I think we also included a um, a line item for lighting uh, along the path. Um, so if that's something the town would like, we did include it. And I'll just mention, Greg, that over here on the left hand is where it connects to the, the previous intersection. Yes. We looked at, and then it continues up the road. Um, here's the other side of the school and the entrance to um, there's a transportation and a rec fields up, up this side. Just for right. Context. Any other questions on this one? One in the back, Larry? Yeah, uh, uh, Larry Brown, uh, Dan Amateurs. Um, I remember from my childhood those wonderful lattice work bridges with the drumming roar of the, the tires and a complete belief that the car was going to go through to my death. Um, for the a pedestrian pathway, core 10 steel, uh, lattice work with complete uh, cob drainage under it. Anybody thought that? So kind of an elevated path with drainage would, underneath. Yeah, the, the pathway would be like the lattice work of a bridge with that, mm -hmm. that steel infrastructure. And all water would be free like a giant box uh, culvert. Scumbers. You know, damn amateurs. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, no matter how we did it, that is an option is, you know, we, we could also um, have a series of small culverts to allow the water to get through underneath. Um, you know, that I think it's a final design issue, but I, I, I think that's a good idea to let the water go under as opposed to over the path. It wasn't porous pavement. Yeah, porous pavement would help with the path, um, you know, with the, the water that falls on the path, but it would also have to accept half the roadway runoff. Um, and 
all the silt that goes with it, which would probably make the porous pavement um, less effective, I guess. You're trying to use this tax project to solve a, a state highway problem with road runoff? I mean, <coughs> tax should be its own merit. You are addressing issues with 155. Well, it, which isn't a cost of the project because it should be a cost just of 155. Well, the road runoff doesn't go away. You know, you have it's still going to head towards the path. But you're you're trying to use the path as your means to take care of maintenance. You should be doing the 155. The path should be its own should be its own merit. Well, if you didn't build the path, you wouldn't have to do anything. You know, so what I'm suggesting is by building the path you now have a problem from the runoff that's already happening and uh, you just can't ignore it. You know, it's gonna, it, it, it has to be dealt with if you're building the path. So, so therefore it's, it's not just a path, it's a drainage improvement project. Mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, the, by building the path, you need to address the drainage, yes. Because if you don't build the path, you're not going to address the drainage. Correct. There's no problem without the path. The, the water right now just runs off the side. That's not a problem. But you don't want it to just run across the path. So is the town supportive of maintaining the sidewalk year-round? <laughs> yes, if it... I'm sorry. It sounded like it was something we could use our regular plow for. It wouldn't need a special um, equipment. So yes. Yeah, typically a ten foot path, <clears throat> ten foot wide path can be cleared with a pickup truck. Yeah, and we have those. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Next. Uh, next project. This is the. Um, New market Colin Lens project, we're calling it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said it in jest. I think Colin was involved with some of the ideas behind it, which is awesome. Um, so this is uh, the downtown New Market. The real um, concern or the purpose of the project is to address the uh, 155, I'm sorry, 152, 108 intersection right there. Um, the issues there are really as a result of the horizontal and vertical geometry, very limited sight lines. Um, it's difficult for cars coming eastbound out of 152 to, um, you know, find acceptable gaps in the 108 traffic. 108 is free flow there. Uh, 152 is stop controlled. And uh, so the the idea is what could we do um, to improve safety and operations at that intersection? So uh, what this shows is a novel idea to um, change a, a small segment of 152 to eastbound, I'm sorry, westbound one way. Um, so you would no longer have that conflict of cars coming out eastbound trying to enter the stream of traffic on 108. Um, they would now go around, they would take Jerry Ave, which is down to the bottom left, um, to enter 108 at another intersection. Um, and kind of a circulating pattern for some of the vehicles. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, now the intersection of 108 at Jerry Ave is uh, stop controlled for Jerry Ave today. 108 is free flow. Um, so uh, Jason ran the numbers and determined that a traffic signal would be warranted there, and it would be a really great idea to have a signal there because, you know, we're pumping in a, a lot more traffic uh, who can no longer go eastbound to 108 up on 152. So uh, you would be creating a heavy left turn demand as they come down that approach to get onto 108. So it would be signalized. And um, there is a signal there that is uh, related to the um, railroad crossing which is just to the south but that signal is black otherwise it's only it's only run when there's uh, trains so we would be putting in an all new traffic signal at that intersection and it would have to be coordinated with the trains um, so there'd be an added cost um, for that coordination uh, we would also need to control there's two driveways across from jerry 
um, that would need to be, uh, one of them would need to be an in, one would need to be an out with signal control because it's right in the intersection. So just a little complication, but seems manageable. Um, so to do this, we would have to widen uh, Jerry Road there uh, just a little bit. We calculated we would need a 200 foot long um, left turn lane. Um, so both lanes would need to be 200 feet long. Um, it looks as though it's a little tight on the right of way. We couldn't tell from this figure whether we would need right of way, but there's a likelihood we need a little bit of strip taking on one side. Um, the intersection up at um, uh, 108, I'm sorry, 152 and Jerry could pretty much stay the way it is, but we would need to heavily sign it so that people know that if they're headed to 108, they need to take Jerry Ave. Um, so going up to the, where we were making, yeah, if you zoom in on that, Colin, the thought there is that we could reduce the road width um, by just having that one travel lane westbound. Uh, we could take advantage of that. We could have a couple of bump outs, have really improved crosswalk. Um, and there's no sidewalk there today. It's really unique where the, the cars are basically parking right up against buildings. Uh, so this would give us an opportunity to put in a sidewalk have defined on-street parking, uh, you know, a little bit of beautification, maybe some street lighting. Uh, so it, it's kind of extending uh, the beauty and the functionality of the, the core downtown just a little bit further west uh, to this inter to this little segment. Um, and functionally, Jason, I don't know if you want to talk about you know what we've what we're seeing, but the this intersection at 108. Um, it would remain free flow um, and, you know, I think would function much better. Right. And, and as you can see with the arrows that are on the screen right now, Creighton Street is already a one-way departing uh, the intersection. That's not going to change. Um, and as you're going westbound on 152, that would be the only part and it would match. Uh, that would be the only change and it would match the Creighton Street departure. So um, really the only conflict points would be the left turns uh, on 108. Uh, anybody that's coming northbound wanting to turn left on that short segment or anybody coming southbound and turning left onto Creighton. Um, down at the uh, potential signalized intersection of Jerry Ave and 108, um, that intersection would be able to operate at level of service B uh, with all the lanes operating at level of service C or better. And this is, again, all, all of these traffic volumes and the analyses and everything that we looked at were all, and this is for all the projects. We used a 20 year design horizon. So those are 2042 traffic volume conditions for the weekday morning and the weekday evening. Um, and then up at the other end of Jerry Ave at 152, um, that approach would be operating at level of service D as in David or better. Um, under the morning and evening conditions. Um, as Greg had pointed out, the important thing is for the eastbound motorists on 108 to know that they have to turn right onto Jerry Ave to get to, um, to, to get to 152. I'm sorry, from 152 onto 108. That's the, that's going to be the important thing is the signage to be able to direct the, the motorists, um, so that they're not continuing eastbound on 152 and then have to turn left up onto South Street. Um, at that intersection of South Street, anybody that's coming down South Street, so that's to the, yes, thank you, right. Uh, so anybody coming down would have to turn right only. Um, the movements coming from 108 would be able to continue straight through or turn right up onto South Street. And anybody going eastbound on 152 would have to turn left onto South Street. So th that's, those areas are definitely going to have to be signed. Um, advanced signage is going to be important. It's going to be a definite change um, in, in the area. I think that, you know, that segment of the one way between South Street and uh, 108 um, provides a lot of different opportunities, as Greg had pointed out, you know, um, for the sidewalks, for pedestrian safety, uh, to make sure that people are not going to be challenged by um, interacting with a different type of environment that's out there today, um, as cars are definitely going a little bit faster once they leave 108 and going on to 152. The hey, other alternative, okay, yeah, I'm ahead. sorry. Sorry, you were probably about to say what I was going to say. Yeah, okay, ahead. yeah. The, the other alternative we looked at was signalizing the 108 right. and 152 Creighton Street intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges that we we were faced with was um, that south leg of 108. Uh, it's it's steep coming up the hill. 
um, to that intersection. And what ends up happening is, um, you know, once you place those northbound movements under signal control and a red indication appears, uh, what happens during the winter time? You know, and, and, and just the challenge of not just the regular automobiles, but the truck traffic trying to get up that hill from a stop condition um, when it's when the traffic signal is red. Uh, that's why we we kind of went away from that option was because of the existing, um, I guess, horizontal curvature, the, you know, the up, upgrade going approaching that intersection. Um, would the traffic volumes meet a signal? Yes. But I think the the um, geometry of the roadway would be a real challenge and something that uh, would be very costly to change <laughs> the yeah. grade of the road. It'd be tough, yeah. Question, would, um, and I think we have a few more, but is a left turn from here, is that permissible today? And did you say that that would be, that would be permissible under this alternative? Yeah, it, it's, it's allowed today and it would remain allowed. I don't know how many people would actually do it other than maybe someone that wanted to get to those businesses that are on the south side of 152 where the new parking would be. Right. Because they would have already taken Jerry out. Correct. Yeah. Um, I think one thing we recognized was that um, this concept would need to go through a pretty intensive public process. Right. You know, with uh, changing patterns and, and, you know, affecting abutters and that sort of thing, uh, you know, enhancing the downtown, there's benefits too. So um, I think that, you know, that's one footnote on this one. I think Steve, you had your hand up first. Well, <clears throat> that was my first question was the footnote. And uh, I, I think the design solution is uh, very interesting, but, you know, as we think of bringing these projects forward to the DOT, we want to make sure that all of our projects will pass local uh, review. And I, I was wondering about the businesses on 152 in that one block and then the Jerry Avenue uh, business. And putting aside the footnote, does the cost estimate that you provided um, include that uh, full signalization at Jerry and 108 with the business access and the rail crossing yes. coordination? Yeah, we were. We were pretty conservative with that number. Yeah, we did bump it up. And I'm sorry, I don't see it in front of me. What is the number for this project again? That's right. Uh, Seven sixty nine. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Watson, you have your hand up too. Yeah, thank you. I think um, uh, mine are similar comments or, or questions. I guess one that I would also include here um, the significant, well, so the work on Jerry Avenue, I don't believe is eligible for federal funds under the 10-year mm -hmm. plan. Jerry is, is local road mm -hmm. as the Durham Point Road uh, question that I raised earlier um, needs to be dealt with. It also looks like in addition to the business, business impact and other considerations, uh, there'd be significant discussion that would have to happen with district and the town over maintenance responsibilities. Um, um, who would be responsible for which roads and would there be ch changes in those responsibilities as a change in circulation? Has any of that conversation happened yet? No. Okay. Thank you. Good, po good points. My, my question is, up where you, you said that you're going to be able to turn left, going that one way, is that going to have, not going to have the same effect as a stoplight? Someone would have to stop and wait, yes. Right, and then the whole idea you talked about trucks coming up that grade and everything, isn't that going to have that same effect, potentially? I would, I'm not a truck driver, but I would hope they would not be trying to turn left at that angle, if that's what you're talking about. Well, I thought you said we could do that. It's permissible now, yes. Do you mean a truck getting stuck behind someone who's waiting to turn? Oh, around? yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the same effect as having a light in, in well, potentially. We believe it's fairly infrequent that most of the people taking a left would be taking a left at Jerry. I agree with that based on my observations. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I did the council. <laughs> <laughs> I, I exactly. Um, uh, the at the intersection of Jerry Ave and 108, did you evaluate any consideration of realignment to the approach, the approach to 108 
to tee it up more and make that left turn onto 108. There were very few brave souls that did that at, when I was doing the counts, taking that left from Jerry up to head north on 108. And even when they were doing it, it was kind of this a one. scary approach to get out there and turn into the traffic flow. So, yeah. and, and, and I understand that that may be consideration for final design, but teeing that up would be a safer alternative, particularly if it's going to be signalized anyway. That's a great idea. I tend to agree, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. It it really comes down to um, the impacts that would take place uh, right where Colin's hand is right now with the realignment, because now you're you're really trying to make it more perpendicular. Um, I, I and we want to make sure that we're accommodating those northbound left turns, and especially if there's any um, you know heavy vehicles, the, the trucks that might be trying to make up um, make that maneuver, just to be able to accommodate it. But yeah, that that would definitely be taken into consideration during the the design. Good question. Good point. Uh, this is Dave Landry. Just a quick question. I'm familiar with this intersection, but I'm not sure about the 152 and whether there's a grade change. So if you're coming up, I don't know what the you know the big truck volume is that will be pushed down Jerry to then make that T or whatever and to go back up the hill, but isn't the section of 152 the part that doesn't have the sidewalks and that kind of thing? Isn't that relatively flat right there? Yes. It, okay, so is there not just just general concern about some traffic and and maybe big trucks and buses or whatever else into two significant grade changes, one significant down and one significant up that they otherwise don't have even, you know, it's not only shorter if you continue through there, like they have been for like probably 200 years. Um, but enforcing them into two very large grade changes, that, I don't know why that seems like an issue to me, but so my question is, has anybody thought about taking maybe not all of this project, but part of this project and trying it out by getting a lot of Jersey barriers or something like that <laughs> and setting it up and seeing what happens? And I realize you do a lot of modeling and all that, and that's way over my head. But you must have lived in Dover. Well, but you know, but I've seen it done in other places. And that's it, right. It's an interesting thing. Dover did it for about a year around the post office by putting up temporary yeah. barriers and signage to see if a traffic pattern would work. We've yeah. talked about that part yeah. nine, I think, Lindsay, as well, about the the the, uh, the, the catchphrase is a, a, just a demonstration project um, to demonstrate what it would look like. And I, I, I see that being feasible as part of the extensive public outreach that would need to happen. Okay. All right. Good. I'm sorry. I, I, I've tried to not say this, but really in the end, uh, I'm not sure if the grade issue coming up from the south uh, to the existing intersection that you, you, know, you want to change the flow of the traffic at uh, 152 and away here. Okay. There is a signal in Dover when the ice conditions are so bad that. There's nothing you can do to either get up or get down the hill. It's Oak Street. It's mm -hmm. Oak Street and Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. The police department turns the signal to flash on the main line, and it seems to work. That's infrequent because obviously we know that New Hampshire is the biggest salt putter down our state <laughs> in the lower 48. And uh, there aren't too many times when that really is an issue. I mean, I, I really wonder if the only reason why you didn't consider the, the one signalization as an alternative uh, was because of the steep hill uh, and not looking into other strategies that could be used if you did that? I think just remembering our conversations in the past, I remember that the winter issue um, Winter was an issue, but also just trucks chugging up that hill. We have to look at air quality stuff and, and impacts because it's so close 
there isn't a rural intersection. This is effectively the downtown. And depending on the wind, someone's going to get all that diesel. Um, but but a fair question whether with, with the signal. So thank you. The other consideration I see is when you make that portion one way, when the lower portion floods, you lose your detour, right? Can you, how do you get through then if that lower portion is flooded? Because there is, um, I believe it's right here. That Moonlight Brook is in here somewhere, um, and New Market Park. You'll have to. Check yeah, it's me uh, <clears throat> it's right near the river, uh, near the mills. Go up. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, like right there. Yeah, so you can. It kind of goes underground a little bit. Comes day breaks a little bit too. So, is there a history of that intersection flooding? Is that? Yeah, in two thousand six, uh, it flooded. Um, uh, in the Mother's Day flood. Yep. Yep. But New Market is working on a a mitigation project for that or at least at the outflow i believe yes uh we're looking into that correct any other questions all right um greg i guess we're up uh, all right um so summer's worth um unique intersection <clears throat> um where the main road is free flow <clears throat> excuse me and the side streets are stop controlled but what's unique about it is the the two approaches coming down from the north where today they they kind of merge or meld together in one location but they they really are in conflict with that, with each other at the same location so what happens is you know there's a guessing game with with your uh with the other vehicle who's going to go first uh and you're doing that at the same time looking for gaps in the main line traffic and then you're also you have another car coming from the other side so it's kind of a um you know a difficult situation that uh, has the potential for high impact side you know type crashes um the road is signed at 30 but i'm quite sure people are going well above that where it's it's really a very straight and flat um flat roadway so um and on, on top of that the existing pedestrian accommodations are a little bit um of concern uh it's hard to see under there but there's a diagonal crosswalk um, that goes across there you go yeah so it's right there and um, there's a sidewalk on the bottom right quadrant um that they're coming from but there's no landing there's no ped ramp there's no sidewalk on that northern corner so um this what this concept uh is attempting to do is slow vehicles down make the intersection a little more uniform or, or a little more uh organized as far as those two approaches uh and provide better pedestrian accommodations uh and a better mid-block crossing that is shown in the right so we're proposing to widen the roadway a little bit uh, like four feet on each side through the intersection, um, add raised uh, medians about six foot wide uh, that would provide pedestrian refuge uh, for the one that has the crosswalk. <clears throat> and then we would still have the other uh, median just as a traffic calming measure uh, to have motorists understand that they're coming into a, you know, kind of a complicated intersection. So, um, the crosswalk that's shown we would put uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons just to again uh, enhance the safety for those people crossing uh, from what we read from the town's information this is a fairly high pedestrian location uh, so we felt that that one crossing probably warrants a better treatment than just a crosswalk um, so i think that's kind of it in a nutshell nutshell the, the hope would be that combination of reducing speeds and providing better um, accommodations for, for PEDs uh, would, you know, improve safety. Um, question. question in the room? Yeah. How close is the Summersworth High School? Uh, Michelle, you have to back me up. Where the, it's just down here yep. to, the, to the bottom right. So, I think the first driveway is just... So, foot. so... Do, do school students make that crossing on a regular basis? 
Pedestrian school students. Yeah, and then uh, folks from Summersworth who did the traffic counts um, in person aren't in the room, but they did notice. They, everyone who did the, the additional traffic counting for us um, said they saw all kinds of near misses, and, and in this case, a lot of a lot of students. They were appeared to be students at the at the pickup or going to school and leaving school. So, so the RRFB is uh, proposed to be installed on West High, but not on Maple. Right. The thought there being that Maple is stop controlled, and um, you know wouldn't warrant it. And you generally put in the RRFBs at mid-block crossings and not at intersections. Right. And there's uh, an alternative yeah. beat. Yeah, this is the nuclear solution. Um, <laughs> we just wanted to test, uh, see if it fit, and you know what would what. This is kind of what I would call the optimal solution. <laughs> um, this would address the traffic calming, it would address the safety for the vehicle approaches, uh, and it would improve pedestrian crossings, uh, you know, at multiples of cost. Um, and you can see where the right-of-way impacts are in pretty much every corner. Um, so, you know, again, we didn't have any back and forth with the community, but we wanted to show both options. Um, this would function extremely well from a traffic, pers traffic operations perspective. And we would expect it to have the highest safety benefit as well. Does that does that include pedestrians? I've I've tried to research safety for non motorized users at roundabouts, and I haven't really found a definitive answer. But it, it feels like the previous alternative may have been safer, where a roundabout is is great for vehicles, but it potentially creates blind spots for for pedestrians where the cars are theoretically traveling slower on a roundabout which but they're just so much there more points of potential contact here what what are your what are your thoughts on that Gregor Jason? yeah so um yeah to, there's a lot of roundabout um proponents out there who will tell you that they're so much safer <laughs> um but that's usually in comparison to a signalized intersection. Um, I think you make a good point that the previous alternative with its mid-block crossing and the RRFBs um, probably is is right up there on the safety side. The speeds would be higher with that one. The, traf the vehicle speeds would be higher, but uh, you do make a good point about the motorist going through a roundabout is looking at more things maybe. Um, the, the advantage here is the refuge islands are much larger. The pedestrian is still only crossing one leg at a time, so they they only have to look to their left when they cross. Uh, it's a pretty simple, you know, from the pedestrian's perspective, it's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know the data, um, you know, how it would stack up, how these two alternatives would stack up, uh, but it's probably pretty comparable, pretty close. I hear. I guess it. I guess the safety factor, looking at it just briefly, is is good it it adds an inconvenience factor to go if the pedestrian is going all the way over this way but I, I suppose that's splitting hairs considering they pretty much have to do that um, with those alternatives so anyway yeah no. it's a good question what sure um i live here uh i'm also on the school board and uh this is an intersection that i avoid because there is crossing there, and because everybody coming from anything other than High Street is hitting the gas to cross the road. And mm -hmm. so they're they're not slowing down. They're they're trying to get they're trying to speed across that road as quickly as they can. So if I gotta go to the hill, I go, I mean, as as crazy as the intersection is at uh, uh to get up to the hill uh, at the other at the end of uh, High Street, West High Street, um, I go that way. I'd rather climb the hill than go up the backside because of the issues that are here, and um, and go through the lighted system. So, uh, 
it's a problem for kids crossing that road. Um, so that's just my I, own observation and what I personally try to avoid. I neglected to mention that we did examine whether a traffic signal would be warranted here, and it is not, unfortunately, because that might you know, eliminate the vehicle vehicle conf conflict issues if it could be signalized, but it does not meet warrants. I, I find it interesting that the Sunset Drive gets equal weight of importance in all of these plans as two major intersections of major roads. So Sunset just feeds the subdivision. And had True. you looked at King Sunset into uh, Maple Street there on the north side so that you ended up with just a crisscross and not five. Roads. Yeah, we. I. I was actually kind of in favor of teeing it in. It would have a major impact on that that one property there, because you don't want to tee it in right at the stop line on Maple. Uh, you have to move it back a little bit, and that would have you know cut their lot in half. You know, uh, so we didn't show that alternative. But from a traffic perspective, yeah, it probably would have made a lot of sense. Else? Moving on. So the last one, we don't have uh, a similar design kind of layout because this is the Summersworth Complete Streets project on Main Street that was 60% um, designed by a, by a separate um, engineering consultant. Uh, we've been here too long. So this, I'll, I can let Michelle speak more to it, um, but complete streets using that philosophy since this is a multimodal kind of main street um, and, and has a lot going on. So. Yeah, so this is a complete uh, streets project in, on Summer North Main Street, which um, historically um, the sidewalks are in pretty poor condition. Um, we had a beta analysis come in and do a sidewalk analysis on the streets. Um, some of the sidewalks are not ADA compliant at this point and don't tip downs. So this would be redesigning the whole entire street with traffic calming, ADA compliance, and it's actually sewer mm -hmm. and water and utilities on the ground. So it's a major project. It's on Summersworth's capital improvements plan. It's been voted on. Uh, we have we have an updated cost. Um, I know Jen handed out this. Uh, Inflation costs, but it's about a four million thirty thousand dollar project. Uh, we just updated our CIP to include this project, and that cost is a ten percent uh, per year inflation. So it's a little bit higher than what was proposed um, originally, but it's not four point eight million. Okay, so we would need to get that updated sheet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so if I could just touch upon that, I know um, I kind of snuck around the room quietly and handed out to everyone an updated spreadsheet with the project costs. Um, we, you know, with things coming in <laughs> under the wire here, um, and, and Bill had a great reminder that we needed to double check whether inflation was included. So, yeah, so we handed out the updated um, numbers mid-meeting here um, to add the inflation in. So you've got your project. So the table includes your project estimate costs, your total, and then the, the total is inflated out 10 years at 2.8%. Uh, this one. And Megan emailed it out to everyone. No, uh, just one thing, uh, yes. consider these are LPA projects in local match, 20%, and that's not part of your allocation. Oh, good point. So that would further reduce the project. So that's a good point. Thank you, Glenn. So that's another thing to kind of factor in when we're thinking about the numbers here. Um, that's, that's, that's not here is that all of these projects would be LPA projects. Um, so the DOT share would only be 80% of what is here on the on the spreadsheet. So we'll have to do a little bit of, you know, pull out your phones and do some math uh, as, as we're going through this process. But Michelle's project that she was just speaking about, please on that row, 
um, disregard both numbers that are there. Yeah. Um, so it would be 4.030 million. Okay. Is that today's dollars or the, is that? Inflated? That's the inflated. That's the inflated number. That's the inflated number. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that one is already inflated. And I, oh, I didn't talk about, there's a lot of development coming in on the main street. Um, we have a number of projects um, that are in the queue. Mark's on the planning board. He's seen some of these in conceptual design. Um, so we have a lot of development pressure. So this is sort of the ideal time to start planning for these streets. Well, can I ask a quick practical question? So we're not all messing with calculators too too much. Is there is all the match stuff plan? Is it it's twenty percent no matter which of these projects it will be? Right. Yes. So if the regional allocation is five point eight four seven, this number down here, if we just multiply by one point two, it's seven million sixteen thousand. If we just use that kind of a number and don't try to change every one of these numbers as an overall number, that also works. I think you need to be multiplied by one point or uh, one point two five. And you're just Wait, what are we multiplying? Why would you do two five? Because it would be eighty percent. That would be increasing that the project by eighty percent. Show what the oh. Thing would be. It works out. Oh, okay. All right. This right. Is the total, but these, but these oh, are the good. total costs. So we'd be multiplying by 0.8. So if you multiply by 0.8, you reduce the projects down by 80%. Right. To, to show the, the DOT share. share. Increase, your, your, increase your allocation by, by 20%. Um, and we're the same thing. All right. That's what I'll write. So I'm going to come back over here for us. I just wanted, I just wanted mm -hmm. one way or another, I wanted to just have that total number back. <laughs> Right. Yeah. All right. I don't want to miss Steve, but she's got a question real quick. I just have a macro question. Uh, Jen, you said the assumption is that all of these projects would be LPA projects. And I'm kind of curious about that. For example, on the Durham 155A main mast, why? I mean, to me, I, I don't remember that being... I certainly understand CMAC, TE, all that stuff, but why are we having to look only at this being LPA process for projects that in some cases are on state highways? So that was my first question. And then, um, you know, I, this has all been wonderful. I, I, I know it's an obvious that we all wish the uh, engineering reviews had been available earlier, but my concern macro is local conversation about the acceptability of some of these designs in a political forum at a local level. And then my second concern is verified eligibility. Three questions, sorry. The LPA, local political conversation and verified eligibility. Could, could Bill comment on the LPA? Yeah, Bill Watson, do you have any any additional comments to help with the LPA question here? And, and yeah, I apologize. Can you ask it again? I was. Um, yes. I was. I was Sorry. Um, so the three macro questions and some were uh, the statement has been made several times that these all would definitively be LPA projects. And I'm kind of curious about that, given that some of them are on state highways. Wouldn't we benefit from DOT managing them? And then my other two comments were macro concerns that some of these projects which are you know brilliant designs and it's great to see objective numbers they haven't gone through the lens of a local political review we all know how that can be even with the greatest project so that's a concern and then the second concern is uh the raised question about federal eligibility of some of them so so from an lpa perspective, um, one of the things that we look at when we start having conversations with towns is um, if you are talking about, for instance, and I'm, I'm just randomly picking um, the shared use path in, in Lee as an example, uh, the department typically does not manage sidewalk shared use path, shared use path type projects. 
So a project like that by its nature would lend itself to be an LPA project. I understand that that may or may not be, you know, that is along a state highway, but it, it is, again, it's not a, a state facility that's being built. It, we look at, at shared use paths and sidewalks as, as local facilities. Um, the other projects, if they are in an urban compact area or if they are currently maintained by the town, would lend themselves to being LPA projects by default because those projects are already, those roadways or those facilities are under the control of the towns. Does that help to answer the concern or maybe it raises more questions? No, I, I get that perspective. I, I still think one or two of them might be more traditional DOT projects, but thank you, I understand that. <laughs> Certainly, you know, there's, there's opportunity for conversation um, and certainly for towns that if, if, the, if you understand our approach, but then your, your feeling is, oh my gosh, are we capable of managing it? There are opportunities for the department to manage on behalf of a town that still allows it to be in the LPA arena and not okay. us necessarily driving the... And, driving and the my approach Bill, on this question was, we all know that the LPA process adds a lot of extra costs. I'm not suggesting that the DOT can do projects far cheaper, but we know that the LPA program and the required additional oversight does add project cost. I, I, the, so the additional cost comes when you're not able to have your own staff design a project. So consultant costs are typically higher than a city that has their own design staff or the department that has their own design staff. In terms of administrative oversight, uh, the rules are the same for an LPA project as they are for a department project and the consultant should be just as um, capable of handling those administrative costs. VHB, for instance, they're doing an excellent job. They are doing an LPA project right now for Stratford Regional Planning Commission doing this work for you. Um, they are doing an excellent job. There is no more administrative overhead for Greg and his staff working for SRPC than there would be for Greg and his staff doing the exact same thing for us. And the other two comments about um, local political review and eligibility check. Um, so we would agree with Steve, we agree with the, the, the local check-in uh, and eligibility. We, we have concerns over the projects that we've expressed eligibility concerns in. I want to get to Michael here real quick. I think that's part of that. So I just want to be mindful of what we actually have to accomplish today, yes. and which is selecting uh, projects that fit within the allocation plus one or two. And this is not the final selection. You know, this is what goes to DOT. Based on the numbers here, it looks like we could fit every project except for the Durham Point Road one if we went for the cheaper alternatives on the two that have alternatives. I don't know what role we have in choosing alternatives, and that makes a big difference here. Is it possible? So, so, so yeah, that was, I was trying to find a time to, to thank Michael to <laughs> say that that is, that is our task for today, and this is not the final, final, Caplock's final decision, but maybe the one of the first points of order is to hear from Summersworth and Lee on the alternatives, the A and B alternatives. So, I mean, the Summersworth roundabout, you know, if that's, if that is even possible, or if, if you are willing to, Michelle, say whether one of those is more likely, um, and same thing for, for Lee, um, especially if, you know, that, that big five-way intersection has a lot of question marks still around it, so. So, and I put in red font the two that um, our representatives from DOT mentioned during the conversation that there was some concern about either the eligibility of the entire or a portion. Um, so the new market one, there was a mention that uh, there was concern that Jerry, um, Jerry Ab is not eligible. Um, and then Durham Point Road is not also not federally eligible. 
Uh, Dave? Dave? Andrew? Yeah. This is this is Wayne. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can hear you, Wayne. Rick Rainey has called me. He's the director of public works in Durham to say that the Durham uh, Point Road is in the system and eligible for federal funding. Um, and secondly, I just like to mention uh, to the gentleman who mentioned. <laughs> what was it, beach blanket, bingo, or whatever it was, all of the terms in that uh, resolution passed by the Durham Town Council are from the uh, documents around the project, and they're the, those are the criteria they use. So, so it was the government that did the beach blanket, bingo, whatever you called it, not the town of Durham. And by the way, we pride ourselves in a public setting like the Durham Town Council to be examples of good writing. So... But uh, we have to watch ourselves next time to make sure we don't use the government's language. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, the next um, step, can we, can we do something um, about these? Uh, we've got an A and a B here. We obviously, I mean, it's not an illogical next step is to try and figure out how to reduce things that have two very different choices. And the people that are from those towns are probably the best people to speak to it because I have, I have no idea. Think well, some of this is common sense and the common sense with regard to the Summersworth uh, <coughs> roundabout uh, in, in, in lieu of the straight line stuff is how are the neighbors going to accept that incredible amoeba and will they, and is it politically acceptable? And I, I'm sorry, but for me, that's common sense. It really is. Uh, that one, I think we could probably agree that that given it's much higher cost and what it's gonna to do to the local community is, uh, is incredible. So that one might be easier to uh, discard than maybe the other. I don't, I don't, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, and that might be the net result of our, our thinking about it, but uh, let's let's give the some of the work people the first crack at it in case they already kind of know the answer to A or B. <laughs> Did this get sent out to Mike Lewinsky as well? He would have received it this morning. morning. <laughs> All right. Um, I remember. He, don't want to make that call, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm for option one. I think option two is is going to have a lot of problems with the butters potentially. And um, I mean, I worked on a roundabout, Rochester's roundabout. And how many years has that taken? That <laughs> is still not constructed. Twenty years. Twenty years. <laughs> so, I I so, seem so. to remember Summers were or Mike saying. He wasn't really excited about a roundabout specifically for the, the right of way issues. And Mark lives in that area. So. Yeah, I, I would I would agree that uh, option one is would be more accepted not only by the neighbors but by the community as at large. Um, and I'll and I'll just a reminder that the DHB helping out us uh, helping us out on this is a game changer because. All of these cost estimates go into our metro plan. And if something changes in the future and everyone says, hey, we want a roundabout, but can you fund that through a different venue than the 10 year plan? That we have all of this information to go on for future funding sources. So if, if nothing else happened today, if no decision was made, we'd have all these projects in, in the metro plan ready to go for, for, for anything else. Um, so. All right. So we're still screen sharing, right? So Can everyone see the Excel on, online? Yes. Oh, awesome. sure. I don't know how well you guys, how your eyes are. I had to fix it on the laptop and then put it on the screen. Um, so hopefully you guys have better eyesight than I do. Um, so I added a column to the right of our inflated column that is the DOT 80% share um, this is the number that we have to, the 80% share is the number that we have to work with when we're, when we're pulling together our total allocation amount. Um, 
So just trying to kind of highlight things as we talk, um, just to help with the decision making. And Lindsay, you had a question, sorry. Yeah, a couple of cost questions mm -hmm. uh, with this discussion. So for the Summersworth Main Street project, this cost, total inflated cost that's in here, does that include the utilities or is that just the That's road taken road? out, it's an $8 million project okay. with utilities. Yeah, just the transfer. So I just wanted to clarify that piece. Yeah. And then on the new market one that was mentioned of some portions being ineligible. So is there, I'm guessing VHB doesn't necessarily have a breakdown now, but is there a way that we could get a determination on what would be eligible, DOT eligible, or should we just assume that it would likely be less than this 80% share because we would remove some portion of the cost that the town would have to bear for the geriatric improvements? I'll defer to Craig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that one, I guess the big question is, is the signal at Jerry Ave eligible? It's on Route 108. Um, that's a big contributing cost. Uh, the widening on Jerry itself is pretty minor, in, you know, in comparison. Um, so, yeah, from a, from a department's perspective, the signal is not the issue on Jerry Avenue, right? It's, as Greg just mentioned, um, it's it's the other work on Jerry Avenue, and really, it's a conversation about the 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 long term maintenance and who is responsible for what. Um, if you're changing traffic patterns on Jerry and on 152, and you're looking at what is currently locally maintained versus state maintained, there's a larger political conversation there that may overarch the, um, the relatively small cost of widening Jerry Avenue. Right. But for our cost discussion and the bottom line of what's in the allocation, we can just assume we go with this number. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's where we have some flexibility here today is we're not we're not in like our final final version of anything. Um, we have until um, kind of early 2023 to do that official finalization of everything. Um, at this point, we're trying to get get some solid estimates and some solid projects and descriptions over to DOT that fit within our allocation plus one or two projects. So uh, if we go with the cheaper alternative on the summer of Earth one, mm -hmm. and we assume the most expensive on the um, the Lee one, we, all of the remaining projects, all the way, including Durham Point Road, fit in the allocation plus two. So, so if that is the amount of leeway that the DOT has given us at this stage, do we need to do any further whittling down? That's a good question. So, all right. So, Michael, you're saying yeah. summer's worth a day, the new market project, the more um, expensive so, lead project here. Um, dude, I, I think I did. <clears throat> the, I guess we do need to talk about lead. But, yeah. um, but pick the, just do the quick math to see where we are just to see how much whittling down actually needs to happen here. So, so just thinking about math is probably not the right thing to do. It's part of the equation. And I will say that I've been sitting here and I've been listening. I've changed my mind a couple of times. And just look at the page. I've crossed things out and I've twiddled and whittled here. Uh, but I looked at all these projects from uh, four standpoints, from four criteria. Number one, Best safety improvement you can get. Number two, shared use. Anytime you can have shared use between vehicles and pedestrians and bicyclists, that should be a priority. And number three, if there are transit improvements, that's a big criteria for me. And finally, the money piece, which is getting our biggest bang for the buck. And that's where what you, you say, Mike, comes in is if we can do get all of them into the $5.8 million, that would be wonderful. But I'll lay this out for you. I looked at all of this, and what I, what I came up with, looking at those four criteria, was uh, Summersworth A, Lee A, A1, Lee B, and Summersworth B. Uh, and I'm going to make people mad. Can you read those again? Lee, yeah, it's Summersworth, Summersworth A. a Yep. Lee A1, Lee B, Summersworth B. So if we can do other things on top of that and still keep within the money, 
That's fine. But it's a, it's a beginning discussion point, I think, because I did put safety, shared use, transit, and getting the biggest bang for our available bucks criteria into that consideration. But my question is, <clears throat> didn't we already do that? Didn't we already do that when we did the, uh, the criteria? Is. I don't think we had all of the facts, though. So you're right, we did that. But I learned things here today that I didn't know before. And so I also don't think I I could be wrong about this and I'll regret saying this, but while we did that, I don't think we did that with all these other A's and B's we've added. Right. 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 So right. we didn't we didn't right. we didn't look to see how that all, you know, well you effectively pull a lot of that out. I'm not just suggesting anyway. But right. Steve, do you have your hand up? I, I just want to build off um, the comments just made. Um, I do think that, you know, we're very close to having a package here that kind of fits the first blush uh, budget and expectations with DOT. I, I do want to circle back to this idea of each of us having a final chance to make a quick pitch about our project and, and maybe why it relates to what Bruce just said. But I think this has been a very good process to work through this together, but I do hope we can make our final little 30 second pitch <laughs> for why. Um, oh, check the math. Um, uh, isn't Michael correct that we can, we can put all of the projects aside from Dura Point Road with the, the various A's and B's forward to DOT to accomplish our, our task today? Well, we haven't talked to Lee yet. If we go with yeah. the Lee's, cheaper alternative, we can send them all, including Durham Point Road. So there's no need to remove any projects if we are comfortable with the cheaper alternative in Lee. It, and the DOT allows us to send two past the, the allotment. So there's room for all of these in-depth conversations to keep happening, but we don't have to do that now if that's the leeway we have. We can, we can dig into it further. But, but we haven't heard from Lee on if Lee is comfortable with the cheaper alternative, because that would make a difference. This sounds like a great place for me to talk. <laughs> 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 so as the person who lives in Lee, I have to tell you, our residents um, are not huge fans of the traffic circle. It is where almost all of our police and fire go in our huge traffic circle. It's not going to be an easy sell. Um, I think I'd be much happier going with the cheaper version. So if that helps. That's... That would make sense to us. So we can Sounds keep the music taking into it, but we don't have to. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not trying to cut Thank anything you. short. <laughs> and so if we went with that, um, so if you go summer with A, you mark it A, Lee A1. Lee B, Summersworth B1, that puts us just shy of our allocation. So then plus two, one or two, you could then pull the Durham projects. And, and right. because those two, depending on which you consider the two over, because they're expensive, I don't know if that's how DOT counts two past or if they would count the three most expensive as being passed and then say we sent five past. I don't know how they're doing that math, but we were we were told to follow our rankings. Okay. Yeah. So um so that's reasonable to do it. So going down our rankings, our top like stopping our ranking, following the order of rankings, stopping at our our um allocation, we're under and then those would be the bottom of our ranked projects based on our current ranking, and that's one plus one or two. We'll re-rank, like now that we have all this information, we'll send them to DOT, we'll get their peer review of, of the engineering and the estimates, and then you'll have it all over again to redo your ranking. And then we'll make our final, final selection. I like but you need, a, yeah. you need a motion from someone yes. on the tech. Yes. yes. I'll, uh, to I'll do make something. a tech motion <laughs> that, we, that we send them all with the, with the two um, the ones that have alternatives sending the two of the lower, 
the lower cost option. And your motion is to recommend to the policy committee. Correct. Do I hear a second? Second. Wonderful. Is there additional discussion about this? Are, are there? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. So we've shown Durham Point Road in red. However, there's Durham Point Road in red. However, there's my understanding is it's eligible. So we're going to be looking that's included in my motion is to send Durham Point Road for further review with you. As, it the, was just as part of the one or two. Okay. Yes. okay. So that so, will just, we'll just need to confirm between Rich and yourself and, and DOT about that eligibility. Okay. Yes. We can change that back to black. <laughs> additional, uh, additional discussion or questions? We got comments on my Bruce. Okay. Uh, I saw Steve, your hands go up. Yeah, my additional comment is simply uh, in speaking to the Durham Roundabout project, um, I am hopeful that with further uh, fine-tuning critique, we may not need two slip lanes. In honesty, uh, the project that has been presented, which I love, the engineering drawing of, uh, it is almost twice the price of what we had originally expected because we didn't expect a two slip lane roundabout uh, sense of scale. We don't have any two slip lane roundabouts anywhere. Uh, Scammell Bridge, Lee Traffic Circle, Portsmouth. So I'm hoping that maybe we can get by with a thinner, lighter, trimmed down, less expensive project there, which might help all of our macro efforts. Um, I also wanna be very transparent. Um, we have a CMAC round that has letters of intent due this afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, the university certainly views that roundabout at 155 Main and Mast as CMAC eligible. Um, and we will be proposing that as a backstop for this project um, because of the, tr tr you know, we have every 20 minutes full transit buses going through that intersection. So to Bruce's point about transit, uh, I just wanted to be transparent that we're looking at that as a CMAC LOI today as well. Um, so uh, I'm hopeful that we're very close with the full list. If we do some belt tightening around all these projects and look at and look for the DOT's feedback. So I will support the motion of putting in the full list and hoping that with feedback and um, belt tightening, we're there. Any additional comments or questions on the motion? Even Just a, in Zoom a, land? A quick, quick comment. Um, I hope that uh, people did learn today that that project in Durham Point uh, really is critical. Um, and, and we hope that it, it could be reevaluated. But if it's, uh, I like Steve and his crew have done a great job at UNH and uh, if, if we can fit that project in I think it'll go a long way to improving the safety of people who are now using that road. I need to correct one number. I think at one point someone said the traffic was a thousand cars a day on the road. It is a thousand cars a month which is still pretty high but I wanted to make that that correction. Um, I think that's true Greg. Uh, I don't sure if you made the comment. Um, but in, in our resolution, it says a thousand cars a month, not a day. So I think it was a thousand a month coming from the transfer station. Okay. Um, um, it's rich yeah. rain. I oh, just, just from it's yeah, just from the cars per day. And on and we have a motion on the table. Uh, if there's any other comments on the motion, can, can you read the motion that? once again just to make sure everybody's got it? To recommend for the TAC to recommend to the policy committee that we submit to the DOT for consideration. Um, Summersworth A, Newmarket A, Lee A1, Lee B, Summersworth B1, Durham A, and Durham B. Thank you. All right. Hearing no additional comments or seeing any hands in Zoom land, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, call a question and we're going to have a roll call of the TAC. All right, I'll call rules for you. Thank you. All right, <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Vanessa? Yes. April? Yes. Lindsay? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Williams? Yes. Jill? Yes. Glenn, representing DOT? Yes. Uh, Marshall? Yes. Bruce? Yes. 
Online, Steve Pesci. Yes. Uh, Tim for DES. Yes. Katrin for Lee. Yes. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Can I note that I, as the commissioner is voting, or is this just a tag question? Let's just tag. Just tag. Commissioners are next. Thank you. So, all right. Anything further from the uh, policy folks? Any other questions? Anything? No. Okay, I'll need a motion on that. Somebody on the policy. Same wording. There's no difference. It's just coming back. Policy wording. Barb. Second. Barb. Second. Barb. I'll second. John. All right. Good idea. Do you want to see if there's any further discussion? Is there? Oh, I thought I asked that. Um, is there any further? Didn't I say? Is there any further? Anything further? Okay, I just have one point. We are going to leave the. I know this may be a minor thing, but we're going to leave based on ratings. We're going to leave the order the same for what it might be worth. Correct. Correct. For now. For yeah, now. It, the, yes. Fine. Yes. Fine. I want to just meant something, and I want to make sure it's, it still means something. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. Call on the roll for the policy committee. Bill. Yes. John. Yes. R. Yes. Michael Williams. Yes. Uh, from DOT, Glenn. Yes. Don. Yes. Larry. It was yes. Karen. Yes. Uh, Joe. Yes. Uh, Mark? Yes. Dave? Yes. Online? Peter? Yes. For UNH, Steve? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Tim? Yes. Fred? Yes. Well, I think that leaves us uh, just leaving. <laughs> There's nothing else, to do, nothing else on the agenda, and I'll take a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman? Uh -oh. Yeah? Yes, sir. Can you tell where it's coming from? Uh, this is Tim from uh, DES. I just wanted to take a second before we... Um, end the meeting that um, I wanted to let everybody know that I'm going to be retiring from DES effective uh, December 1st. So... I just wanted to make sure that I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone knows that it's been my pleasure to serve as a member of the uh, Stratford MPO and TAC uh, over the past six years. I've actually enjoyed working with all of the New Hampshire MPOs, and I just want to wish you um, all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Good luck. Thank Thank you. Tim congrats. Congratulations. We'll miss seeing you. Thank you. Uh, all, okay, all in favor of uh, Tim retiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We won't ask for any incentives. Before the uh, vote for, for adjournment, I thought the policy committee might be commenting on the, on the nature of the materials presented to us. Um, I believe I am accurate to say that narrow traffic lanes um, overarching tree canopy uh, and historic homes and stone walls are the hallmarks of scenic highways. Uh, and particularly the narrow traffic lanes and the overarching canopy are themselves traffic columns. Thank you. Thank you very much. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 <laughs> Have a wonderful Friday. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Oh. Hi. Very good. <laughs>